Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to these, this uh, Congressional Internet Caucus Academy briefing on uh, blockchain beyond Bitcoin, uh, building trust in a digital age. We'd like to thank our uh, co-sponsors for this event, the Congressional Internet Caucus, um, whose co-chairs on the House side are Representative Bob Goodlatte and Representative Anna Hsu, and on the Senate side are Senator John Thune and Senator Patrick Leahy. Uh, we really appreciate all the logistical support they've given us, uh, and we're excited for the discussion today. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to our moderator for today, uh, Lydia Bayoud from Bloomberg Law. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. We're glad that you're here. This panel is uh, trying to cut through some of the hype around Bitcoin and other virtual currencies and instead get into some of the innovation uh, that's taking place with blockchain technologies. Um, thank you to the Congressional Internet Caucus Academy for assembling this panel. They, we've got a good lineup of folks who can talk about blockchain from many different perspectives. Uh, I'm going to go down the aisle and introduce each one of you very briefly, but then let you all talk about uh, who you are, what you do, and how you guys got started in blockchain. And we've got one panelist uh, missing who may show up a little bit later. We'll welcome him when he arrives. So uh, to my left is Amy Kim. She's Global Policy Director and General Counsel at the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Uh, then we have Jason Albert, Deputy General Counsel at Workday, uh, followed by Tiffany Angulo, who's the Legislative Assistant for Congressman David Schweiker. Uh, she's also the staff co-chair of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus. And last but not least, uh, Isabel Corbett, who's Head of Regulatory Affairs at R3. So Amy, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the... Uh, Chamber of Digital Commerce. Sure. Um, can you hear me all right? I'm um, sure. Thank you, Lydia, and thanks everyone for having us here. I think this is a great conversation to have, and one that we're um, constantly a, a message that we're constantly trying to bring um, to the public, to the government, to Congress. Um, so I think it's a great topic to talk about today. Um, I had the legal and policy work at the chamber. We are a um, trade association with uh, about 200 members now. That was founded in 2014. And we advocate and educate on blockchain-based issues, whether that um, involves virtual currencies or other use cases uh, that we'll talk about here today. Hi, I'm Jason Albert, and I'm Deputy General Counsel at Workday. Uh, Workday is a provider of what you might consider back office services for enterprises, primarily in human capital management and financial management spaces. Uh, we do it as a cloud-based service, so we offer a, uh, everybody, we talk about the power of one, everybody's on the single code line, uh, so uh, you have a service that's the, that's the same across all of our customers with high degree of configurability, easy self-service, and powerful analytics. Uh, you know, I lead our government affairs and also our privacy and regulatory compliance and look forward to you talking today about uh, some of the possibilities we see for blockchain, uh, particularly in the enterprise space. And hi, my name is Tiffany Angulo. Uh, I am legislative assistant to Congressman David Schweikert, as mentioned. Uh, my boss is the co-chair to the Congressional Blockchain Caucus that was created in the 114th Congress. And the main goal of the caucus has been to sort of educate and help lead the conversation on blockchain and its potential uses. So happy to be here and listen to the conversation. And I'm Isabel Corbett. I head up regulatory affairs as well as what's now being called GovTech, essentially partnering to sell the solution that we're building into government. I'm excited to be here. I think that we have a, a diverse set of panelists here. We at R3 are actually building our own blockchain platform. We are a software company with over 200 members, investors, partners, and regulators. And our platform is called Corda. It is built specifically for business. So it is, as I will say probably multiple times today, just one implementation of blockchain, although it is one that is built for business, for regulated institutions. Um, and we just released our enterprise version last week. And this year, you'll be seeing commercial deployments. So this is definitely a timely panel. And um, Amgad uh, Shahada, who's the Senior Vice President of International Public Affairs and Strategy at UPS, uh, has been able to join us. Amgad, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and a little bit about your interest in the blockchain? Sure. Thank you. I, I know you noticed I came in just in time, and that's kind of a thing that we do at UPS. We make sure we deliver on time just in time. 
Um, I have responsibilities for uh, global policy at Borders with UPS, been with the company about 28 years, started as a driver up in uh, Toronto, Canada, and work on a multitude of issues at Borders, obviously. Uh, trade is critical and cross-border uh, data flow as well as movement of goods is critical to us. Um, I would tell you that we've been working on blockchain for about six months now uh, wholeheartedly. I've been obviously looking at it for about a year and a half. And as it says on the program, digitization of paper is obviously uh, critical and key. Um, I would tell you one of the challenges, though, is uh, we talk about standards and protocols and subledgers and, and languages. Just like international languages, blockchain has a language. And I don't want to insult anybody, but I only have so much depth on blockchain, and I don't want to go so deep, but I can go a little deeper in the Q&A session. But... Bottom line is, if these global standards start to um, multiply or bifurcate and you have different language, um, we already would have a challenge in regards to a current process across uh, customs um, authorities around the world. So as we are undertaking the current process, we're going to take a blockchain process. So we're going to actually spend money and have multiple channels, multiple processes, duplicate process, redundant processes. So the one thing you don't want to do is have 14 or three even different blockchain processes that mirror a standardized process. So one of the challenges is, and that's why we're sitting here and in many capitals around the world, is to talk about a, a global um, standard in order to communicate with each other. And, and blockchain has the potential to do that as well as uh, the opportunity. Um, the other critical key is some of the panelists or sometimes uh, some people in the room are customers of ours. So as those customers begin to look at blockchains, either for their internal processes or to communicate with their vendors and suppliers, it's gonna be critical to have one standard across or, or at least a handful of standards across um, across uh, both the customer externally and internally. I give you an example. We, um, you know, we're a small package company, but we're an ocean carrier and we're a freight carrier as well. One of our customers came to us 15 years ago and said, you no longer can deliver to us, we're a Fortune 50 company, but you no longer can deliver to us using skid sizes X, Y, and Z. We want you to use this skid size that's colored this way to move our freight all around the world. So we were at a crossroad. Every other customer uses globally skids that are this size and move this way versus this one customer. And either we lose the business or secure and keep the business. We obviously made a strategic choice and reconfigured. I find, and that's a, I guess a, a roll up your sleeve under the dirt under the fingernail kind of example, but you hyperextend that over to blockchain and I think it's critical for companies to embrace the opportunity and figure out a way uh, to undertake that standard. The last thing I'm going to say is this is not only a U.S. race. We're working in countries in Asia and in other uh, regions where they're undertaking a digitization of forms and, and, um, and processes and standards to try to get to the finish line first. So it's almost a global race to what the standard is going to be for communicating in global supply chains. And I'll stop there and answer more on uh, Jim Cuny. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Amgad. So before we proceed into questions, I'm curious, uh, how many of you would say you have a pretty good grasp of you know, either cryptocurrencies or blockchain technology? Okay. Good mix. A few, a few hands like this. Um, so just so everyone's kind of at a, a, at least a baseline level. Amy, can you sort of help explain the relationship between, let's say, virtual currencies and blockchain? Uh, sure, yeah, I, it's, um, you know, every time we talk about blockchain, virtual currencies, and other use cases, everyone's on their, at, at a different place in their journey and understanding um, and, um, and, and um, believing in the technology. So I'm um, just going to take a minute to kind of level set a little bit and then hopefully lead into what everyone else um, on the panel wants to talk about today. Um, so uh, as a baseline, a blockchain is a form of distributed ledger technology that organizes data on a ledger chronologically, um, secures it with cryptography, 
and uses some type of mathematical process to achieve agreement or consensus um, that the transactions um, have occurred as intended. Uh, so typically these technologies have a, a number of attributes um, that go along um, uh, for, for each blockchain. Um, they can be um, decentralized in some way uh, with some type of peer-to-peer -peer networking. Um, in that regard, some may uh, not have a central authority and some may, depending on how they're set up. Um, they, they, are, they are a ledger, uh, so a chronolo chronological recording of transactions. Um, and then they're secured with cryptography um, to add that uh, extra layer of security and immutability um, to them. And then finally, they have some type of independent um, method to verify that the transactions occurred as intended. Um, so that combination of factors, you know, each one of those sounds like, oh, that's been around. There's ledgers, there's cryptography. The combination of those factors and those technologies together makes it a truly transformative um, technology that can span geographies, it can span businesses, peoples, products, uh, to make it um, truly interesting for many, I won't say all, um, but many use cases, and I, I'm looking forward to talking about um, some of those today. Um, and so one other thing to kind of help understand how that is, um, you know, blockchains often generate tokens. Um, the first token being Bitcoin that was generated through the Bitcoin blockchain. But other blockchains can have different tokens, and those tokens can represent different things or different interests. So, uh, you know, we like to divide those up into two categories. The first being um, purely blockchain-based tokens or blockchain-based assets. So Bitcoin would be one of those. It doesn't have any independent existence in the real world. Um, on the other side of that are um, tokenized assets. So something that actually does have um, an existence in the real world, like a uh, title to land, like um, an ownership in some type of item, um, your digital identity, medical records, those types of things can be tokenized um, onto a blockchain um, and then um, traded and transferred and recorded on, on that ledger. Um, so th that's where you can kind of, you know, your, your imagination can really start to grasp what we're looking at and, and how that would be interesting for a company like UPS, like R3, um, when you're dealing with shipping and transportation and, and custody of an item um, through geographies. Um, and over time, um, and um, also when you're dealing with um, even um, central banks and the movement of money. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Isabel, could you tell us a little bit more about how R3 works with financial institutions and other industries and, you know, sort of get us beyond what a lot of people think of the blockchain as this open distributed ledger that almost anyone can access, but how enterprises, you know, may want to introduce more control or more levels of authority into it. Sure, and it looks like from the show of hands, there are a lot of people in this room who have looked into this and understand the differences in terms of uh, implementations of blockchain. But I'm going to draw on some of those to make this point, which is the idea of the Bitcoin blockchain is really an incredible one, right? And it's one in which you don't need trust and you use proof of work, which takes a huge amount of computing power. That makes a lot of sense when you have parties who don't trust each other, when you have parties who may be misrepresenting their identities. You want to be sure that, that the transaction is what, what you say it is and that the, the assets are actually moving as they are supposed to. But now, if you take the, the kind of elegance of the Bitcoin blockchain, you take out the best pieces that, that are the cryptographic pieces, that are the immutability, but you take those into the business world, you actually are going to be operating in a, in a permission system. So where you know who it is that you're trading with. That means that you will not be on a blockchain that needs that same proof of work element. So businesses like BlackRock, Cargill, Bank of New York, they're not going to be on these trustless anonymous systems because they don't need to be and, and the power that it takes to keep those going is too great. Now, there's certainly a place for those systems and as I said, there is certainly elegance to them. Um, R3 created our platform, Corda, because we were started by a group of banks basically trying to figure out what was this blockchain thing, was it worth anything, should we start looking at it? Turns out the answer is yes and that's why we're all here. Um, 
but so the idea was, okay, how do we take this and build it for business in a way that regulated institutions can use it? You know, I think everyone in this room understands that there are a lot of regulations that apply that keep institutions from seeing the transactions of others. Now, there's obviously post-trade reporting, but I'm talking real-time transaction viewing, which is why not only is our system permissioned, but our system actually has limited data sharing. So that means data is only shared with those who have a need to know. You can look up information on our platform online. There is tons of it. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions about it afterwards or right now if everyone's interested. Um, but really that just highlights the different implementations and the different uses of them. You know, R3's Corda platform is built for business. It accommodates regulated transactions amongst regulated institutions, but it, it's just one of many. And this year, as we're looking at the first commercial deployments, we have them kind of all over the map. We have trade finance, we have KYC, uh, we have securities lending, we have syndicated lending, um, a, a pretty big mix. So you'll start to see the business implementations really rolling along this year. Isabel, uh, do you want to define KYC and just for you guys generally, define your acronyms? Yeah, absolutely. KYC is know your customer. So AML and KYC, I think, are things that all of us in the room have heard about. Maybe you know a lot about it, maybe you don't. But both get to one thing, which is um, a lot of data and accuracy of the data and control of the data. So anti-money laundering and know your customer both require data to come in, data to be updated to make sure that you know who it is that you're transacting with and that you're monitoring for um, risks along the way, any red flags. Thank you. And just for the audience, we will leave time at the end for Q&A. Um, so Jason, I think we've sort of led into a space that you could talk a little bit about, and that's this issue of digital identities. And, um, you know, Workday is well known, I think, for its human resources software, but you do a lot more than that. And you guys just recently joined the Sovereign Foundation, which is a nonprofit. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So we're really excited about uh, the possibilities of blockchain in the digital identity space. So if you think about it, you know, we all have various identities. So I have a government identity, whether it's my passport or my driver's license. I have a work identity as an employee of Workday. Um, you know, I don't have any hobbies, but if I played golf, I might have a handicap and I might have like a, you know, something in my golf club or I may be on like a tennis ladder or something like that. And so, you know, and right now, you know, we live in a world where these identities tend to be in paper. I have like a physical passport or a physical driver's license. They also tend to be intermingled. You know, we all use Social Security numbers for a lot more things than merely getting, uh, you know, our, our retirement benefits. And so if you think about it, you go to a bar. Uh, if unlike me, you don't have gray hair, you might get carded. And you have to show the bouncer your driver's license. It has your height, has your weight, it has your birthday, it has your driver's license number. And all the bouncer really needs to know is... Are you over 21 or not? So imagine if you could have a verifiable claim from somebody that the, that the bar trusted uh, and, and that was able to put a verifiable claim that, hey, you're over 21, and you were able to demonstrate that through blockchain so you could share it using cryptography with anybody who needed it. It was signed by, you know, a trusted authority, whether it's, you know, you know, the, the, you know, the, you know, the state of California or something like that. And that way you get in the bar, you don't have to share all this other information. And then you can imagine expanding that beyond, proving your educational credentials, uh, proving your work history, things like that. Uh, and so the Sovereign Foundation really offers, uh, in our view, a solution for generating trusted claims that are tied to you know, a private key and stored on a blockchain so that they're immutable, they're verifiable, anybody can see them. Uh, you know, and, and we're, you know, you know, pleased to be able to, to participate, you know, and, and, and think about that as we take digital identity forward. I'm curious, what's the form that that might take? I mean, as these technologies advance and as people start buying stuff in the market, you know, there are rings that have these types of IDs where you could scan your ring. And we've all got these smartphones that have a lot of information about us. What are, how are consumers going to be able to, you know, use that digital ID? Well, I think we're we're all still thinking about that, but I mean, you know, I think there's sort of one common example that that uh, that we all know and love, which is that I've taken increasingly to paying for things with this phone. Like I have a little, I have an iPhone, so I have, you know, an Apple Wallet, and now I don't have to take out my credit card, and I can just you know 
hold it there and magically, you know, I'm able to pay for things. And so you could imagine, you know, having sort of a similar think about it as like a wallet of identities that you'd then use in different in different contexts. Um, but you could imagine other thing, you know, other ways of doing it. But I, this is a great device because you know we all have one, we all carry it, we all carry it around, and we're familiar with using it. Okay. Um, so I, I'm going to add. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. One quick thing there, and that's a kind of call here to everyone in the room, which is the best way to get these effective identities to be used on blockchain is that we need the governments to start issuing digital identity along with your driver's license. So you get your hard copy driver's license, but they also issue that digital identity in parallel. And ultimately that becomes a part of the identity that you can use on a blockchain system. So there are a few regulators around the world already looking at this and, and working on it so that it's not fast forward five years, everyone run to the DMV right now and get your ID reissued digitally. So that's something that we'll, we'll see more and more of and we're encouraging uh, regulators to think about starting to do because it's not going to be an overnight process. Well, and Tiffany, that might be a good place for you to jump in. Um, you know, with your involvement in the Congressional Blockchain Caucus, how do you feel about that idea? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if anybody has ever heard my boss, uh, Representative Schweiker, he's from Arizona. Arizona has the real ID, so they have to essentially be compliant by 2020, or October of 2020. And so that is essentially our terror right now, that you're going to have a bunch of people running to the DMV to update their licenses or, you know, trying to board a plane after October of 2020 and not being able to do that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we've we, we've looked at the gamut of sort of, you know, medical records, being able to vote, um, all the way to like, yes, having your license, you know, some, you know, my boss also, he's on Ways and Means, so, you know, medical records is a huge thing. He's on the IT task force looking at that, um, and we see blockchain as sort of a, a toolkit, and, you know, or a tool within that toolkit. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's, we've, we've had briefings on the Hill that we've tried to host here. So we have like a voting, company called Votes come in, and it was uh, blo using blockchain for voting, and we did a demo to sort of showcase, you know, how easy it could be. Imagine being able to vote on your phone, and then being able to see right there that your vote counted, and then knowing, you know, that it's, I mean, you can't do that today. So, so yeah, we've absolutely looked and sort of, a lot of what we've encountered with roadblocks is just lack of education and sort of trying to push, you know, and, and being able to answer the questions that folks have you know, because we do want to have consumer protections, but at the end of the day, like, we're sort of, there's so much innovation happening in this country, and we're sort of, we need to move faster, so. And that's one of the things my boss and Mr. Polis are trying to do. Amy, uh, can you add on to this discussion about digital identities and, and working with government to sort of advance, uh, you know, systems, like anyone, anyone of you who's gone to the DMV to update your license or re-register your car probably feels the frustration that, why can't this be more digitized or uh, a little bit more modern? How are governments, or including the federal government or state governments, working towards that using blockchain? Um, so, yeah, those, so that's a lot. I'll try to unpack that a little bit. Um, first of all, I'll just say I think digital identity is one of the, um, the most um, promising use cases of blockchain because it can then be plugged into all of these other places. Um, and, it, and it does, um, I think... You know, I think that's something that consumers can really feel ta a tangible benefit. Um, I think it's also one of the most challenging. Uh, they're all challenging, but I think it is one of the more challenging because if you think about, well, how do you go about starting to do that? I mean, like what Tiffany was saying, you know, the DMV, that's a state-run process. Um, when you think about voter and election, voting in elections, again, another state, um, a state-run process. So that's a state-by-state -state, um, um, challenge. Um, and then think about at the federal level all the different ways your digital identity is um, confirmed or tracked or recorded, whether it's through the State Department with passports or visas, um, TSA, um, Department of Homeland Security, Social Security, um, you know, and your, and your right to certain benefits. Um, so there's, there's a lot of challenges there. Um, and I guess, you know, where to start, right? I mean, first we tried to, um, at the Chamber, um, meet with um, these various government agencies, um, primarily at the federal level, but also um, at the state level, to help educate them to understand better what it is and, and how this can be implemented to try to then help develop a glide path for our members to then try to develop their um, products and services. Um, I think the other challenge that we have um, is, is really just the way that, 
and, and in particular the federal government has approached blockchain, um, you know, they've had to use, you know, we have these kind of silos of agencies and the laws that they implement. Um, and they're governed by those laws and they have to, inf uh, you know, uh, enforce them. Um, but what we've seen um, evolve, develop um, in large part, not, and not entirely, but there's an there's a aspect to this where you just see a lot of enforcement actions, um, um, you know, whether it's um, when the securities, with respect to money laundering, you know, all these different areas. And it, we're really lacking um, a, a clear voice um, from the highest levels as the benefits of what, exactly what we're talking about on this panel, which is, I think, why it's so great. Um, is really uh, the benefits that blockchain can bring um, to, um, to governments, to business, and to citizens, and look at it from that scope first and try to develop this technology um, in that perspective. And then, um, you know, and, and with that as our template, then, of course, enforce the laws that need to be enforced. That's important. Certainly not saying anything other than that. Um, but I think we, we need to add to that conversation a recognition um, at senior levels, and you're starting to see some bright spots. Um, I think Chairman Giancarlo, for one, um, there are others, um, Congressman Schweiker, you know, you do see people who are very supportive. Um, we, we would like to see more of that. That's Chairman Giancarlo of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Um, so, MGAD, um, tell us a little bit about how blockchain is sort of being implemented by the transportation industry, and, you know, why do you need or why are you looking at a technology like blockchain? You know, what is it that you want to do that you can't do with existing technology? So I'm just going to pick up on, uh, and you can correct me because I'm not a personal identity uh, person, but um, if I'm not mistaken, any baby born last year in Estonia automatically now gets a digital identity on day one of birth. So the birth certificate has gone away. And so to my earlier, that was last year, I think. So my earlier comment, we should do some homegrown technology processes and use cases and pilots, but we should also look around the world where they've started running already on this technology and either tripped up, failed, or succeeded and figure out how to improve the process better. So to answer your question, for us, you know, we've been, as a company, we've been around over 110 years and what's really uh, been apparent, obviously, in the last 10 years is the enablement of technology to change business models. So every time we move a good, you know, two other things move with that good information and funds. So somebody bought the goods, somebody's transferring the goods, somebody's reselling the goods. There are, it's a known network. It's a permission-based network to the language that we used before. So in our case, in the transportation supply chain world, you really have an ecosystem that's primed for, yes, I bought those goods. Yes, I paid for those goods. Yes, those goods are trusted. And yes, there should not be intellectual property challenges with those goods because all the parties are known to each other. So you can create that closed circuit, cloud-based ecosystem where the nodes create transparency between each other and trust each other. What's really exciting is companies had an SAP, net, SAP network, have put in an Oracle network, have changed all these networks. Blockchain has the opportunity to transcend or superimpose itself across many legacy systems and create transparency across the whole supply chain. And that really works in this world of business to consumer and e-commerce because then you could start with consumers that say, yes, I have, you have my permission to include me in this node or in this, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm using the language right, but at least in this information supply chain. And those goods that I bought from Asia were purchased by me, they're, they're copyrighted, they're trademarked, and they're legitimate goods. So the exciting part of what this does is CBP and other authorities that we work with are always looking for a needle in a haystack. And if we do this right, we're really reducing the size of the haystack because you start taking away the, the trusted people in the network, and then you start to be able to hone in on the untrusted or illicit goods. Actually, can you expand, because you talked about you're a part of this global industry, and a lot of these companies that are implementing blockchains are global companies. How do you work with uh, customs officials internationally and try and get them on board with the idea of using blockchain in this way? I think 
just like we're looking at it now, many others who don't have, I would tell you countries that don't have the built-in legacy systems and infrastructures. For example, I think the United States has, has gone under an 11-year effort to create something called the single window in customs, where 46 agencies in the U.S. now have information on in one single platform for imports and exports into the U.S. That's taken 11 years to do and a lot of money. There are countries around the world who want that same transparency, that same cohesion and cooperation, but they don't want to go through that effort. So they're raising their hand and saying, maybe technology could help me get there without building that infrastructure. So really, we're working with countries that have uh, raised their hand and said, we'd like to leverage blockchain to leapfrog the traditional processes and create more transparency and more trust in the supply chain. And I asked earlier for a show of hands uh, for those of you familiar with virtual currencies of blockchain. I'm curious, how many of you have heard of a smart contract? Ooh, a lot of you. Okay, great. Um, well, that's good because there's a lot happening in this space and that's at the business level, at the government level. Um, hopefully some of you can ask questions in the end. But, you know, Jason, I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, Workday and its interest in, in smart contracts and some legislation that you're interested in in that space. Yeah, fabulous. So, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we're both do human capital management, sort of HR, uh, you know, all the, all the things you're there, but we also offer a uh, financial suite of products, everything a CFO needs to manage a company from general ledger to financial planning. And then obviously, you know, one thing that companies are interested in is how you can, you know, enable transactions or make them easier with blockchain. So with a smart contract, uh, just for, for those who may not be familiar, it's, it's simply a, a, an automated piece of code that allows parties to reach agreement and then execute that sort of automatically. And if you think about, you know, some blockchains, particularly those that allow value transfer, you can determine whether some uh, uh, triggering event has occurred, uh, usually through some sort of trusted third party, they call that an oracle, uh, and then you know automatically execute the contract. It takes some of the risk out of execution, helps reduce counterparty risk, uh, and and has a lot of value, you know, particularly in the financial space, but also perhaps in some other spaces. And it's not as if it's an all or nothing proposition. You can have a contract that has, you know, sort of your traditional elements that require some judgment, but for certain parts of it could be automated in, ex in execution. And for us, whether it's digital identity, whether it's smart contracts, we think it's important, uh, you know, as others have discussed, for, for government to enable these adoptions to help, you know, support uptake. And so, you know, we've, we have an, 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 you know, an idea where, you know, we think it would help to eliminate, uh, you know, some, you know, uncertainty around, you know, blockchain transactions by ensuring they have legal effect. And we currently have the eSign Act at the federal level, uh, which gives legal effect to electronic contracts and signatures. Uh, and our friends at the Chamber of Digital Commerce have done a great paper that explains why this applies to blockchain records and transactions, and it, and it certainly does. But uh, what we've seen is notwithstanding that sort of a proliferation of state laws, each of which has some sort of different definition of a distributed ledger, different definitions about what legal effect is, and to avoid that fragmentation and to give some certainty, we think it would be great to amend eSign to make sure that, that it explicitly gives legal recognition to blockchain records and transactions and smart contracts. It's already, you know, has a provision on electronic agents that would be easy to adjust to that. And then that way you don't have to worry about, you know, what well, do we have to litigate whether this is right or do we have to worry about these state laws that may or may not be preempted, but, but particularly these transactions are certainly going to be national, if not international, in scope uh, to provide sort of a, a legal certainty. And then the other thing it does is it discuss what we're discussing here, which is so many people think about blockchain as relating to cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and Ethereum, and it helps demonstrate that there are a whole host of other possibilities in a way that, is, that isn't, you know, regulatory or constraining, but is enabling and promotes its growth. Amy, did you want to talk a little bit about your position on that? Uh, sure. And Jason and I have talked about this, too. And, um, you, you know, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting conversation on smart contracts in particular. Um, you know, what we've seen, um, and given what I've described on the federal level, um, you know, with some of the, um, um, I don't know if it's um, it just differences in, in views in the way that, um, that the laws are being, uh, well, that, that you're seeing some enforcement actions and all this kind of um, uncertainty at the federal level, you've seen um, a number of states and legislators in the states um, take it upon themselves to really promote blockchain. Um, which we think is great, you know, and, but the reaction has been, you know, we're, we're open for business, we'd like you to come to our state. And they look for ways in which 
to do that. Um, and one of those was um, the idea to amend what's um, the state law on this topic, which is the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, or UEDA, everything has to have an acronym. Um, and that was um, enacted and um, it was um, developed by the Uniform Law Commission in 1998. And states then adopted those, I think it's 47 states have adopted um, the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act. And then the next year in 1999, um, the federal government um, um, also basically solidified that position in the federal e-sign act and this is all when the internet was being developed um, and, and gaining traction i guess it took a long time to develop the internet but when it was you know gaining traction and people were starting to address this legislatively um, the e-sign act um, was developed to recognize just as jason said um, that um, that electronic signatures are considered signatures and electronic records are considered records for those statutes that require those things. So basically recognizing the digitation, uh, di digitization of commerce. Um, so you have those on the, on the books already. Um, and we worked with um, Patricia Fry, who was the former chair of the working group at the Uniform Law Commission who developed UIDA and talked to her and other lawyers um, that are lawyers with law firms that are members of ours and really poured over this because it's a, it's a difficult question and, and how to respond to it. Um, the first thing that we um, determined was that both the state uniform law, the UEDAs, um, as well as the federal e-sign act, um, explicitly by their terms are designed to cover technology. You know, not just one type of technology or the technology in 1999, um, but all technologies. Um, so they, they really are, and they were written so that they wouldn't need to be amended, you know, with the understanding that we would evolve, you know, beyond what we knew in 1999. Um, so that's, uh, that's the first thing. Um, and then, um, you know, but, but despite that, you've seen um, states, especially in this, you know, the first half of 2018, introducing a number of pieces of legislation. And a couple of those have passed. Um, we've got Arizona, um, Nevada, and then Ohio at the last minute, a um, bit of a game time um, situation there. But so we have three states that have actually amended their state laws. Um, but, you know, our position on that is, you know, while we see them as promoting blockchain and really champions of blockchain, when you amend your state law in this way, um, you have the, the possibility of, um, it's unnecessary first under the law. It creates some confusion because, as Jason said, the definitions are different. They're not all consistent. And what one person thinks is decentralized or distributed may not be another person's decentralization or distribution. Um, and then the third thing is eSign has a preemption provision. And so when you do attempt to treat different technologies differently at the state level, um, you know, there's a question in my mind as the way these are written, if we could be inviting some legal challenges. Um, that said, um, you know, it's interesting, the idea that Workday has to amend eSign. Um, at the moment, our position is that that, um, that goes against the original drafters and the intention of eSign to be technology um, neutral, um, you know, would we need to amend it in the future when the next great thing comes around? Um, and let's see what happens in the states. Um, there were a number of, there was maybe five or six or seven other states that also attempted to amend their legislation, and that legislation was dropped either because of conversations and positions like ours. Um, California, New York, um, Florida's was withdrawn. Um, so there, I think at the moment our, our position is to try to just limit um, this activity in the states and then focus it on other areas where blockchain use cases can be promoted and help businesses kind of work uh, within the state, the states on those matters. Tiffany, how is your office looking at this issue and is the, are you or the caucus doing anything related to it? Yes. Um, so again, Arizona, uh, they're sort of leading as well. Um, and I mean, that's, they, you've had a number of states, obviously, including Arizona, that they've sort of seen the inaction that we've had at the federal level, and they've decided to take it upon themselves to start moving forward um, to sort of create, you know, so Arizona, especially in the way that they passed a like financial services sandbox bill, to sort of give uh, different companies and industry sort of the space to try out to see if the technology works, which is what we want. At the end of the day, we want, you know, blockchain is fantastic. Is it going to be the end all be all? I don't know. But it is, we think it's a gateway to sort of move a lot of sort of these sectors into the 21st century. And we want the conversation to be had. And so, yeah, so we've looked at it. Somehow the Congressional Blockchain Caucus has become the intermediary. So I have, I would like to say one of the most fun jobs on the Hill because I get to meet with like really cool tech companies that are doing really awesome stuff. 
And, um, and then I'm getting to meet with also state legislature. So we had Ohio come into the office as well. But yeah, I mean, and we've met with even folks overseas to sort of see what's happening. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen, we've tried to sort of, you know, use that as a way to get, you know, to talk to the legislators up here and sort of see, you know, Ohio, you now have folks that are interested you know, you need, you know, to come to, you know, to make sure that you're educated on this issue. But, I mean, I see it as another example of why we need to move forward because we're having states that are sort of taking it as just a lack of inaction. And, you know, we, we want, you know, we don't want to end up with sort of a patchwork idea because imagine having interstate commerce, I, that's going to be another roadblock. So, I mean, we're, we're looking at it. Again, it just, we believe with the caucus, a light touch regulation, you know, a light touch when looking at this tech, but... To also, we need a lot more education to happen at the federal level. Isabel, how is our three approaching smart contracts and its use in the financial system? Yes, smart contracts are obviously fundamental to this technology, and people's views on them vary tremendously. There are some core aspects about smart contracts on Corda that are unique to Corda in terms of how they are built. But when people talk about them, we are talking about them I'm, I'm maybe making a presumption here, but we're talking about them from the standpoint of people with legal and regulatory backgrounds. So the idea is not that an entire contract can be made into a smart contract and the whole thing will be fully executing start to finish. Um, you know, you, you will never be able to hit the arbitration button and just automate that, or at least not in my lifetime, I'm guessing. So, you know, we have to look at these things in a through a lens of reasonableness. Now, that's in terms of the actual body of the contract. Sure, there are, there are certain aspects that we likely do need um, legislative help on to ensure that we can use these smart contracts to the best of our ability. So where regulation comes in on blockchain technology generally, smart contracts specifically, is helping us capture greater efficiencies. If there is friction between regulations today on blockchain technology, that's something that we can design around. There are a lot of ways to do that, right? The answer may be sub-ledgers, which is not ideal. The answer may be only putting certain parts of a, a trade life cycle on ledger. And each change to regulation, each kind of harmonization that we can achieve just increases the efficiencies that we can capture. So every, every time we have to create a sub-ledger, that's an inefficiency. Every time we can bring them back together, that creates an efficiency. So same thing with smart contracts. You know, the more we can work to remove these small bits of friction and allow this commerce to flow smoothly on blockchain and, to be honest, off blockchain too. You know, the, these are issues that, that affect commerce, whether using technology or not. Um, but each of those helps us use blockchain technology in the best way and most effective way that we can. Okay. And one more question before we go to Q&A. Uh, I'm curious, how would you guys, you've all talked about sort of what some states are doing, what federal regulators uh, and Congress might be looking at, but how, how, what's your approach for how they can work together with regard to uh, blockchain technology is either not hindering them, but also making sure that consumer protections are in place. You know, that's the identity space is an obvious application for that, but there's a lot more. I mean, we're talking about movement of goods, movement of money. What are your thoughts? So, you know, we, we've already shared sort of our thought in terms of, of enabling smart contracts and digital identity. So I, I, won't, I won't recap that discussion, but I, the other point I think that would be important uh, on the enabling side is, you know, to, to take Tiffany's point where we have a lot more education is not to regulate too precipitously. So, you know, in the context of cryptocurrencies, uh, we've seen some good things and we've seen some, you know, areas of concern, whether they're used for illicit goods, whether there's, you know, theft or fraud or hacking of cryptocurrency exchanges. And there's a tendency, you know, for people to equate blockchain with Bitcoin and then propose regulation that, while you know properly directed at sort of those harms, 
improperly regulates the technology rather than the particular use case. And so, you know, as we sit here on a panel talking about use cases, one of the things is to keep in mind is that, you know, distributed ledgers are a great technology. They have a number of use cases. It's great to be here to talk about digital identity and smart contracts. But as we think about regulation, we also have to think about use cases and not treat it as a simple, as a single monolithic thing. Yeah, I, I echo that wholeheartedly. And to kind of make it painfully blunt, to the extent that the technology is performing a regulated function, it absolutely makes sense to regulate it as that regulated function. But when we are talking about in a system like the one that we've built and a lot of the systems that you hear about being used amongst the regulated institutions, you're already looking at regulated institutions, trading on regulated venues, trading regulated instruments. So there's a mosaic there. So there's a lot of opportunity to regulate by analogy. We're talking about the same businesses that are happening today just using a new technology. And the idea of trying to create regulation of the technology itself is a pretty challenging one, mainly because I don't know where you would start. And I've tried to help people start who are desperate to do it and really can't figure out how. Because regulation of the technology itself, it's, it's an ill fit. Now, that doesn't mean there shouldn't be standards in terms of resiliency, standards in terms of open access, those types of things. Um, we certainly support those. And in terms of how regulators can get involved, we have on our network regulator nodes. So regulators can actually be on the network directly. And that means they would be in an observer only mode, so they cannot be writing transactions to it, but they can be seeing the information that they have a right to see. Um, and, and that means that they get instant updates, instant information about what is being transacted, they can more easily pay attention to um, exposure, pay attention to trading, you know, spot red flags, and that is on a pull basis. So we aren't looking to inundate regulators with data. It's not just going to be flowing in their door every piece of data that we can push to them. It's a tailored view, but it, it creates a much more effective uh, regulatory scheme if you can actually see what's happening in real time. There's definitely a view that in 08, had we been able to see what the financial institution's exposures were to one another, potentially we could have acted differently. Now, what exactly that means is certainly subjective, but it's a powerful tool to have that information at your fingertips. And we have about 20 regulators who we're working with who are already on CORDA, seeing what it's like to have information to that, uh, or have access to that information in real time. So it is powerful. We encourage regulators to, um, to do it, to experiment with it, and that is with our system and blockchain generally. I, I just would like to make two quick comments, and I, I like to use practicality to try to bring us back to sometimes where we get lost in the forest mm -hmm. of blockchain, which is, you know, an I see a lot of young people in the room. If you bought your first condo, moved up to a townhouse, sold the townhouse and bought a house, what you've noticed, what I've noticed is when I first started doing that lifelong journey is I would sign a contract with a real estate agent. It would go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, get the uh, price nailed, and then it would would go to a lawyer. What I've done in the last 10 years, at least eight years, is it's all digitized, digitized contracts. That doesn't mean at the end, when I have to sit with a title person or a lawyer to finalize it, depending on the state that you're in, has gone away. But what it has done is it's improved the process to the point where it's made it efficient. And to your earlier point, the more we could do that until we get the whole enchilada, the better place we're in. And then lastly, I would say, again, practically speaking, technologically, if it doesn't make commercial sense, it's not going to be adopted. So an example of that is RFID. We've been working on RFID technology for the last 10 years at our company, right? And we were waiting until that RFID tag got from a dollar down to 10 cents. And then 10 cents was no longer good enough. It had to be two or three cents in order to be efficient. So with blockchain, unless it's going to improve processes to the magnitude that it makes commercial sense, um, we need to get to that place, I guess is another way to say it, where it makes commercial sense so that we're racing to it to substitute all the legacy systems that we have. 
I'll just add to the question that you raised, um, and I, I agree with everything that's been said here. So just to, um, to add some, a little bit of different side to that is, um, you know, to address some of those um, challenges that you mentioned is um, we have a working group called uh, the Token Alliance. It has over 350 members of industry, um, lawyers, practitioners, former regulators on it, and um, we are publishing in about a week um, a set of guidelines to help orderly um, the orderly um, business, the functioning of business to help protect consumers, to help protect the market, to help promote this, these businesses. Um, uh, so there's guidelines in, our, in this publication. Um, we have um, chapters on the laws that could apply so that people in business, sometimes you're kind of focused on the thing that's you know, right in front of you, um, whether, that's a, you're, whether you're a security or not, whether you're a commodity or not, but there's a lot of other, the consumer protection, money transmitter, um, these other sanctions, compliance, all these other areas. So we have um, those set a compendium of laws for the U.S., Canada, U.K., Australia, um, and more to come. Um, and then also an economic um, analysis and, and metrics as well. So really trying to give people a full perspective um, and ways that they can, um, you know, themselves as businesses um, conduct themselves in a, a, a fair and appropriate way to help avoid some of the fraud um, and other things that we're seeing out there in the market. Thank you. Let's open it up to questions. Um, do we have a microphone? No? Okay. We're small room. Stand up, say your name and who you're with. Go ahead. You, sir. I, I'm happy to take that. So the question was, blockchain is energy intensive, and so does that limit the use cases for it? And my answer is, in my view, and potentially in R3's view, although I guess I am mostly speaking for them here, um, yeah, it, it does. It certainly takes a lot of energy to use the Bitcoin blockchain model. It takes a lot of energy to use that proof of work function where you have all of this computing power so, so you essentially validate transactions using the, the masses of nodes. And that's one of the reasons that we have limited data sharing on our platform and use a, a transaction by transaction consensus mechanism because the scalability of the Bitcoin blockchain is really quite low right now and, and I don't think that we will be solving it in the near term, and we, I mean the whole community, um, of how to use that same proof of work model and make it scalable. So when you think about having all of the data from every single transaction on every single node, you start to see why you're having a scalability problem there. And then when you're using proof of work to validate those transactions, there's another bit. So for sure it, it limits use cases. Um, obviously Bitcoin has been the, the most successful and the best known, but we're also seeing diminishing returns on the um, mining. Next question, go ahead. I can start, and then maybe as well, because I think she probably has a first-hand view into some of those questions. Um, I mean, I think that uh, interoperability is one of the one of the challenges that the industry recognizes is out there. Um, it will need to be addressed. Some people are are, are trying to address that. I think um, I would also like to see some more actual use cases be developed, be deployed, um, and then start to address those things that may be somewhat inefficient, but. Um, it's, these are all challenging tasks, and um, 
so at the moment, I, I mean, that, that is out there, and I think I'll, I'll turn to Isabel because I know that you work with some of, within some of those consortiums. Yeah, I think that the answer to that is actually a pretty simple one, which is, as I said, R3 started as a consortium of banks, and the reason for that was that they were really the ones who stood to save the most money. They were also the ones who were willing to put money in at the beginning when it was completely undefined where this would go. But those were just the original members. We built Corda. Corda was open sourced over a year and a half ago, as well as a lot of other solutions. So the world has been able to download these platforms for years and been able to build on them. Now, what ultimately happens with these platforms is we released our enterprise version. It will be available, fair pricing, open access, just like anyone using Bloomberg, for example. It is open and, and readily available and usable to whomever would like to. Now, on top of the platforms are the applications that are built. So you could have an application for syndicated lending. You could have an application for regulatory reporting. Those are being built by people who we may know of and we may not. The idea is, um, and you know, I can't speak as, as I don't have control over everyone building them, is that they would be open access. Now, if there is an app being built on top of our platform that is only workable because of, let's say, how the data is shared. So it's only workable in the Nordics. Well, someone could just build the app and it will only be available in the Nordics because it's only usable in the Nordics. That does represent some compromise, but there's also still efficiency to be captured there. So the various apps may be regionally specific. Um, the various apps may be addressing a pain point that only exists in certain regions anyway. But the platform, the technology itself, is available to everyone and will continue to be on both open source, meaning free, and enterprise basis. I think we have time for one more question. Really? Okay. So I'm going to do a, a lightning round then to close us off. So we've talked a lot about um, blockchain applications that are kind of nascent or are coming but aren't quite here yet. Is, as you guys look out, you know, five to ten years from now, how do you think consumers are going to be feeling or experiencing blockchain in their daily lives? Go down the line. Um, to some extent, they might not even realize what they're experiencing. I think it may be, um, you know, where we'll start to see some of the um, implementations are more back office functions, maybe in the application of insurance or energy, you know, those kinds of explorations where you'll just get the benefit of faster, more efficient um, um, utilities, um, um, but they'll be kind of running in the background. I would say uh, both on a closed loop inside company uh, blockchain platform, we're looking at it. How does it make our internal processes a lot more efficient? So forget the consumer or the customer extended platforms, but c what can we digitize and have control of internally? And I would tell you that would probably come sooner to your point about a horizon of five to ten years. Nothing is five to ten years anymore. So, um, you know, five to ten months from now, I think we could be in a place where we've done enough to say um, – from a proof of concept standpoint, it could reduce cost, transactional cost, in order for us to, to pursue it even further. As someone who works for an enterprise company, I, I, I have to say I agree. I think, you know, what we're seeing is more applications in the enterprise space and more exper experimentation in the enterprise space than the consumer space. But I think people as individuals will see that. We talked a lot about digital identity today, you know, whether from governments or whether from other types of identities. And I think people will start to experience and see those, perhaps less of the pure consumer space, but in some more hybrid spaces. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, identity as well. Um, I see sort of from meeting with all these like really cool companies, um, more ownership or individual ownership or awareness of sort of where your goods come from. You know, you're, I think you can have it now, Walmart, you can see where your avocados come from, scale that all the way to like, if we have some sort of E. coli breakout with lettuce, you'll be able to see immediately where, you know, or within minutes, like where it was shipped to all the way to, you know, if you want to 
find where or you want to know where your chickens come from, you're going to be able to see that all of that is going to be tracked on a blockchain, um, as well as sort of identity, man identity management, you know, from voting all the way to your medical records. You know, my boss, his big thing is being able to have it on your individual, individual device. That can absolutely be a thing that with blockchain. So, Yeah, I agree with all the points that, that everyone just said. And certainly, you will not be on your phone opening the blockchain app. It could be underlying your apps. It could be underlying websites that you're using. So a lot of it will be invisible. But you will experience it, um, you know, pass through savings. Uh, that's going to be a big thing. We're talking about four use cases that can save 50 to $60 billion in a year. Um, AML, KYC, counterparty risk, uh, repos, um, and red reporting. So, so you will be experiencing that, um, getting that pass through savings. And also, as this becomes more widely used, as it becomes cheaper, who knows? You know, maybe you will be tracking your Apple Music purchases on blockchain. That that's certainly possible. Maybe you experience it in the doctor's office um, in a variety of ways when you don't have to go through all this pain with your insurance. The idea is that you know it, it makes life smoother and easier and cheaper, and that's going to start at the institutional level and will trickle down to the individual level. Great. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you all for coming.